Hi y'all, Nat, the old school otaku here. And in case you are unaware, today, March 31st, hopefully the day that this video actually releases, if it go everything goes as planned, is International Transgender Day of Visibility. And well, in the off chance that you missed the announcement that I made well over a year ago, I'm trans. Surprise! <laughs> For the unaware, the whole point of Transgender Day of Visibility is to celebrate transgender people, our contributions to society as a whole, and to raise awareness of the discrimination that we still face. If you're like me and have been following the news, um, well, let's just say in the past three months alone, there have been a ton of discrimination cases being sent at the trans community. Between bills being debated in state legislatures and some even passing through their governors, the constant spotlight on the words spoken by a specific author of a very popular book series that came out around the time that I was a teenager, and the unfortunate constant violence that gets perpetrated on transgender people every day. It's hard to actually stay positive. And that's just in the United States alone. There are countries where being trans is illegal and some where that crime is punishable by death. In the United States alone, um, there are only 17 states that have passed laws that actually outlaw the use of what's called the LGBTQ panic defense. If you want to read up on some wild defense strategies for murder, that's one that'll send chills down your spine. Or, at the very least, sends them down mine. And while I could go on and on about all of the things that stress me out on a day-to-day -day basis, that's not exactly what this channel is meant for. I celebrate old anime here. So in accordance with that fact, and the fact that it is Transgender Day of Visibility, I wanted to discuss a few anime and manga titles that I, as a young and impressionable trans girl back in the late 90s, looked to for strength, sucker, and inspiration. Stay tuned. Now, I hear some of you probably thinking, but Nat, you only came out last year. How could you be a young trans girl back in the late 90s? <laughs> well, it may be true that I played the role of a teenage boy back then. That fact didn't make me any less trans at the time. I've always been trans. I was just playing a different role back then. However, Despite the stories of ultraviolence, sex, gore, and the like that perpetrated Japanimation back in those days and was typically geared towards young boys like me, I found myself gravitating to shows featuring strong female protagonists. And while some of these titles also dealt with um, themes and topics that could be considered directly trans or just queer related, looking back on them today, most of them are not widely considered by the trans community as actual trans stories. They just meant a ton to me. So I'll try to keep my synopsis um, as spoiler free as I can. I've talked about a great many of these shows um, in the past, 
multiple times sometimes, and in some cases at great length. So I'll try to keep each segment as short as I can, mainly focusing on why I gravitated to the show specifically and how they shaped the woman I would eventually become. So with all of this initial banter out of the way, here are a few anime and or manga titles that influenced a young Nachan. Armitage III, Polymatrix. I think by now it goes without saying that I adore this anime. I first saw it while visiting my grandparents over the summer of 1997 during Sci-Fi Channel's Anime Week. I was blown away at how vulnerable but powerful a character Naomi was. Polymatrix was the first anime I ever owned. The start of my VHS collection. Having received it as a birthday present to go along with the VCR my parents got me that year. Little did they realize just how important this silly little tape from the meager anime selection at our local Best Buy would be to me. The struggle Naomi and the rest of the thirds face to justify their existence, their right to live, their fight to be seen as real and not, as Armitage puts it, a monstrous doll stuck with me for reasons I could not quite articulate at the time. I've only recently been able to piece together why that is the case. However, at the time, Naomi's struggle to overcome overwhelming odds helped teach me that I too could face the challenges presented to an odd teen bullied for her strange effeminate tendencies. Armitage was, and still is, a strong female role model for me. Ghost in the Shell The original movie <laughs> This anime is often brought up as one of the best films from the 90s. It's one of the tapes that eventually helped fill out my VHS collection. While it doesn't quite hold the same place in my heart as Armitage does, its theme is one that sticks with me even today. The philosophy discussed regarding what makes up a person's self and how they identify with that resonated with my young mind. It was cerebral, but at the same time extremely relatable for reasons that I again wasn't able to put my finger on until more recently. In a future where man and machine are so intricately merged that the main protagonist, Major Makoto Kusanagi, possessing a completely cybernetic body save for her brain, questions if a thing such as a soul even exists. A world where people can hack the ghosts of other people, altering their memories, overwriting what made them who they are? What then actually makes up a person? How can you define what that is? What does it actually mean to be human? These questions stuck with me and provided a frame of reference for my own internal struggles with self. Iria, Zerum, the animation. Ah, Iria. Talk about gravitating to strong female protagonists. She's uh, one of the strongest. I first saw this anime back during that fateful summer of 1997 during Sci-Fi's Anime Week, and a year or so later picked up a copy on VHS. Beyond my initial attraction to Iria, older woman, <laughs> what really drew me to her was her resolve in the face of some pretty difficult odds. The music was excellent, from the opening theme that hinted at feelings of loneliness, the bass background tracks that got you in the mood, to the ending theme that leaves you with a hopeful feeling looking to the future. Iria was, once again, a strong female lead who was an unstoppable force when she set her mind to something. She didn't need any man to get the approval of, and she frequently outwits and outmaneuvers the men in her life. And while the English dub at times made her seem like she's a little too hung up on her brother, friend, senpai, lover, honestly, to this day, I still haven't quite pinned down the exact trappings of the relationship between Glenn and uh, Iria. It never seemed to be much of an actual stumbling block for her. Iria ended up being a major role model for me as a teen. 
I wanted to be her. Plus, she's cute to boot. Ranma, one half. It's hard to bring up a list of shows from the 90s, especially shows that are influential. <coughs> In the it's hard to bring up a list of shows from the 90s, especially shows that are influential for trans people, without turning to this gender-bender-filled romp of a story. I actually read the manga for Ranma long before I ever picked up the anime. Right from the first chapter, I was intrigued by the character of Ranma. She was cute and... Dem <laughs> Right from the first chapter, I was intrigued by this character of Ranma. She was a cute and demure girl who also knew martial arts and could defend herself when needed. Imagine my surprise when I found out she was a boy. Ranma's main issue in the story is that while on a martial arts training trip with his father, um, took him to this special training ground in China, where he fell into a spring called the Spring of Drowned Girl. Now, when doused with cold water, he turns into a girl, and only hot water can actually turn him back. Hilarity ensues. Ranma One Half is full of comedic hijinks, random proposals, rivals, love interests, baggage from crazy adults, and sweet sentimental moments. Most of the gender bending is played off for comedic effect or used as fan service. But there are some points where it's used as a vehicle for major character growth for Ranma and other characters in the show. One storyline in particular stands out. It's a storyline where Ranma forgets that she was ever a boy. That story really calls into focus the feelings of what it's like to be trans. Um, Ranma's description of how she felt <laughs> is almost exactly what the disassociation was like for me. Reading this manga back in the day, I always wondered why Ranma considered their condition to be a curse. Why wouldn't anyone want the ability to change into a girl so easily? Why wouldn't Ranma want to be a girl? I wanted to be a girl. Why wouldn't Ranma want to be a girl? Why did I love this anime and manga so much? <laughs> I guess the world may never know. Sailor Moon. <laughs> I'd hope that if you've seen any of my past videos at this point, you would already know how much I love Sailor Moon. In a sense, it was my gateway anime, or at the very least, it was the first anime that I watched and actually knew that it was an anime. I used to rush into my home room. <laughs> I used to rush into my home room in the morning just so I could catch a few minutes of the episode airing on the USA channel ahead of watching the whole thing when I got home. I was part of the Save Our Sailors campaign. Whatever Sailor Moon merch I could find, stationery, books, pens, pencils, erasers, all of that, I would buy and proudly sport it at school, at home, anywhere I could. And of course, I definitely bought the manga that was produced by Mixzine at the time, later Tokyo Pop, and uh, I would definitely read that in class when I was done with my work. The, the story of ordinary girls gaining magical powers and fighting evil to save their town and the world as a whole was so awesome. Shopping, boys, school woes. I even ate up the Deke Sailor Says PSAs that they added to episodes when they removed content that they deemed too risque for young girls to see. I used to spend many a night dreaming that I was a senshi fighting alongside the team. Funny, I never felt the fact that I was a girl in those dreams as something that was odd. I eventually moved on to getting fan subs and learned just how queer the show really is. There were so many characters that shone light to homosexual relationships in a positive manner. 
in Sailor Stars, the Sailor Starlights are senshi that around day to day, they are men. But when they transform, they transform into these bikini clad women. And unlike Ranma, it's not played for laughs. These concepts blew my young mind. This girl growing up in the Bible Belt had a lot to learn about self-reliance and acceptance of queer people from this show. Queen Emeraldus. This was one of the first Leiji Matsumoto shows that I ever got into. The box art of the beautiful woman with long blonde hair just caught my eye and I had to have it. Got into some contention with my mother about it too when she saw the skull and crossbones on her outfit and demanded I return it since I bought the tape with her money. It was a Christmas present. Rather than my own. Luckily, I had already opened the package and seen it by that point. So, sorry, couldn't return it. <laughs> The same, however, couldn't have been said for the first Slayers movie, which I had to return due to Naga's ample bosom being on display on the cover. Though, that did offer me the opportunity to pick up the Sailor Moon R movie. Uncut subtitled version, of course. Which uh, Mom was perfectly okay with because it was just a cute girls show according to her on the cover, right? <laughs> Little did she know, it prominently featured an openly gay character, amongst other topics she probably wouldn't have actually approved of. <laughs> uh, I'm probably getting sidetracked, aren't I? You see, Queen Emeraldus is, again, a show that features a strong feminine role model as its titular character. See a theme here, anyone? Honorable duels with queens ruling alone. The main antagonist through the show ended up being a few arrogant men that had to be put in their place by these strong women. To this day, Emeraldus is one of my favorite characters in any form of media. She's strong, independent, nurturing, and kind. She also stands up for her friends and her beliefs and will not back down from a fight if she needs to. Yet another character that I so wanted to be. futaba change. I realize that not a lot of people actually have heard of this title. It was a manga only and didn't get an anime release. The original run of the manga was handled by Studio Iron Cat here in the States, and I had to, like so many manga and anime I wanted to see in that small town, special order it. However, I never did get all of the volumes before they ran out of print. Thankfully, you can get Kindle versions now, so it's not so difficult to obtain at this point. One day, I'll find those last two volumes that I'm missing and complete my collection. <laughs> like Ranma, Budabakun Change deals with gender-bending hijinks. Though the concepts and storylines tended to fall more on the comedic end of things, they were handled in a much more mature manner than Rama had ever attempted. The main character has a unique genetic marker passed down in his family that, makes, that gives them the ability to change gender when they're excited. This has some interesting complications for Futaba. Once he realizes he can't change back, because she's on her period. Realizing that she could get pregnant in her female form, just like her mother slash father did. Rather than a curse, this ability is often seen as an annoyance and an obstacle to overcome to have a normal life and normal love. I envied Futaba and their family's ability to change gender. So perfectly at that. Why couldn't I have the ability to change into a cute girl? Why? As our frames of reference changes throughout the year, so too do our interpretations of media. 
While not every piece of media is specifically trans or queer, if you look deep enough and with the right frame of mind, you can often find a glimmer in the most unlikely of places. You may not have gotten the same interpretations of these shows that I did, and you may not even believe a single word that has come out of my mouth today. And all of that is perfectly fine. I hope that these insights that I provided into my young mind has helped to shine a new light on these shows for you. And I want to thank you for listening to my story, even if they didn't. Transgender Day of Visibility is supposed to be a celebration, and that's exactly what I wanted to do today. I wanted to celebrate and share these stories that I hold so dear with all of you. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope to see all of you next time. This is Nat, the old school otaku, transgender woman, she, her pronouns hopefully still visible, signing off. Some new bell dandies. This, uh, this one is the one that uh, Ruchan refers to as the B-A-B, Big Bell Dandy, because she is mighty large. I love her.